Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to all of our witnesses for joining us today. I, I find it kind of odd that we're having a hearing that's supposed to be on trade infrastructure when uh, the majority's let so many trade tools such as GSP and MTB expire and, and are about to let one of our most important tools, MTBA, TPA, which uh, you know during the previous administration we'd recognize as a driving force behind expanding our export markets. I've said numerous times, and it bears repeating, trade's vital to the Kansas economy. Uh, South Central Kansas, not only the air capital of the world, but it's also home to many of our state's leading farmers, ranchers, uh, manufacturers, and small businesses. Kansas exports more than $4 billion in agricultural products across the globe, from Canada to Japan and everywhere in between. Getting trade right has major implications for the families and workers I represent. For example, President Trump's USMCA trade deal has directly increased Kansans' opportunities to trade with Canada and Mexico. As two of the largest export markets for American agriculture products, the USMCA success story will benefit South Central Kansas for many years to come. If given good policy from Washington, Kansas can outcompete anyone against the world. Unfortunately, all too often, the policies that come out of Washington don't do us any good. Uh, the so the $2.3 trillion so-called infrastructure plan is a prime example of that. You know, with, with a definition of, a broad definition of infrastructure, I could call my water bottle here uh, uh, essential infrastructure. The plan that stints with tax hikes and Green New Deal regulations will crush American manufacturers and small businesses. Uh, it's, it's really a Trojan horse for a lot of socialist policies because only 5% of it's going to roads and bridges and smaller percentages to other types of, of infrastructure. Instead of focusing on building actual infrastructure that's needed to facilitate international trade and boost our economic growth, uh, this plan focuses on that liberally wish list, including electric vehicles, tax increases on all Americans, and additional bailouts to unions. Kansas and, and my district and across the state don't want trillions of dollars in job-killing regulations and tax increases from Washington. They want to get the goods to market in order to provide their uniquely superior product around the world. In the not too distant past, the need for improved infrastructure was something that both parties agreed on. But today, the Democrat majority seems to be more concerned with pushing radical policies that benefit a few at the expense of hardworking families. I'm additionally concerned that the proposals to make our oil and gas producers uncompetitive in the global marketplace. Over the last four years, we as a nation were able to neutralize the price controls and collusion of OPEC, and we're starting down the road of energy independence. Penalizing American companies and preventing them from competing in the global marketplace will wreak havoc on our trade infrastructure. As we recover from the global pandemic, it's more important than ever that we help American manufacturers, farmers, and energy producers compete internationally. But instead of helping get our economy back to full speed, uh, this bill has, has been enacted to will increase countless roadblocks to growth, like higher taxes, more regulation, and an all-out assault on our energy producers. I believe we must focus on finding real solutions to help improve our infrastructure and encourage exports without tax hikes that limit economic growth. We should build off the economic, the incredible economic gains that we saw under the Trump administration by keeping our taxes competitive and reducing unnecessary regulations. These were keys to helping America create the booming economy we saw before the pandemic and which helped so many families with job opportunities and better paychecks. I'd like to turn to Mr. Anderson for a question. You know, over the last decade, as the United States has become dominant in global energy market, we have seen U.S. energy exports skyrocket. Mr. Anderson, could you speak on the role that Port Tampa Bay has played in Florida's energy sector, and what sorts of investments can we make to further facilitate this impressive growth and make energy trade as efficient as possible? Uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, as I mentioned in my statement uh, to the committee, Port Tampa Bay provides uh, is an energy gateway, provides about half of the, uh, the energy that is consumed and utilized in the state of Florida. So that's 22 million residents and 130 million visitors to the state of Florida pre-pandemic, which we expect to come back. Um, our energy uh, infrastructure is critical, not just, just during normal times, but certainly uh, was critical during the pandemic, even though we saw uh, a significant reduction um, uh, but it is also extremely important uh, 
for those of us in the Gulf of Mexico, all of my colleagues in the port, when a hurricane enters into the Gulf uh, and the resiliency of that infrastructure, and we've worked really hard to protect that infrastructure and be able to recover in the event of a storm, to supply the citizens the uh, the fuel that they need for not just uh, getting back to work, but for air conditioning, for buses, for grocery trucks, whatever the needs are. Uh, and, and we're going to continue to do that at the port and all of our ports. And I would just uh, uh, echo the comments by my colleague, Mr. Cordero, the need for investment in America's ports is critical. Give it to the men and women that work in our ports and we'll give you a return on investment. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Anderson. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back.